Good day, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Biomodels LLC, I'd like to welcome you to preclinical models of immune-mediated diseases to enable development of novel immunomodulatory therapies. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and moderator for today's event. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Dr. Caitlin S. L. Perello, PhD, Scientist 2 with Biomodels. Our second speaker is Dr. Andrew Borkowski, PhD, Scientist 1 with Biomodels. And our third presenter will be Dr. Benjamin Cuffo, PhD, Principal Scientist with Biomodels LLC. Welcome, and Caitlin, the presenter ball is yours. Thanks very much for the introduction, Elizabeth. So I wanted to start by thanking everyone for joining us today. To begin, I'm going to just start with a little bit of background on Biomodels for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization. So Biomodels is a preclinical contract research organization, and we're located in Watertown, Massachusetts, which is a little bit outside of Boston. We were founded in 1997 out of the Brigham and Women's Hospital, but we're now our own independent company and we specialize in highly translational models of human diseases and conditions for a wide variety of clients. Biomodels has therapeutic expertise within a number of disease indications, including inflammation and autoimmunity, the microbiome, oncology, and pulmonary diseases, among others. And we facilitated over 50 compounds into patients across multiple different disease indications. So just an overview of our objectives today. The overarching theme for today's presentation is to describe animal models of disease with immunological components, in which therapeutic targeting of the immune system has demonstrated efficacy both preclinically and clinically. I'm going to be talking about inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, and rheumatoid arthritis. Andrew will be discussing allergic asthma and graft versus host disease, and then Ben will be talking about immuno-oncology. So to start, I'm going to be discussing inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, is a spectrum of chronic gastrointestinal disorders that's characterized by alternating periods of relapses and remissions. Clinically, IBD is characterized by diarrhea, abdominal pain, and bleeding, and it's most typically diagnosed by endoscopy. The etiology is generally, generally unknown, although the environment, genetics, and the microbiome are all thought to play a role. And in terms of epidemiology, there are more than 1.5 million cases estimated in the U.S. and over 2.5 million in Europe. These are divided equally between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, with up to 70,000 new cases diagnosed annually. Onset can occur at any age, but um, it's most typically most typically when young, with peak incidence in late adolescence and early adulthood. And the annual financial burden of IBD in the United States is estimated at being between $14.6 billion and $31.6 billion. Just to get a little bit more detailed in the differences between UC and Crohn's disease, UC most typically affects only the colon, and the inflammation and ulcerations are restricted to the mucosa and submucosa. Classically, Th2 cytokines like IL-4, 5, and 13 are hypothesized to predominate. In contrast, Crohn's disease can affect any part of the intestine, though it most commonly affects the terminal ileum, and it's characterized by areas of inflammation that are dispersed between healthy areas. It can have extra-intestinal involvement as well and can affect the esophagus and the stomach, and Th1 cytokines like IL-2, IL-12, and interferon gamma are thought to predominate. Current treatment strategies for IBD um, range from treating mild cases, starting with five ASAs through moderate, we move into immunosuppressives like 6-MP and as AZAs, um, tacrolimus. That moves on to biologics like anti-TNF and more recently the anti-alpha-4 beta-7 integrins. Um, and then finally this culminates in surgery for extremely severe cases. So like many disease indications, IBD is modeled using animal models. Um, we're always seeking to have the perfect animal model, although that doesn't always truly exist. And in IBD and across disease indications, um, the perfect animal model will replicate the clinical condition. It will have endpoints that are translatable to both those using clinical trials and are also easily interpretable. The underlying biology of the model will be the same in humans 
as it is in humans, and it will respond to similar targeted treatment paradigms. But the model also has to be cost effective and provide actionable information. So an endpoint that Biomodels uses in its IBD models um, that we think makes this model extremely clinically relevant is, idio is um, endoscopy. It's critical that endpoints in IBD models demonstrate a drug's mucosal healing potential. And endoscopy allows us to assess mucosal disease and healing without animal sacrifice. So as I said, we can assess disease over the course of the study in a single animal without having to sacrifice the animal. The images that are captured in the rodent colon are very similar to those captured in humans, as you can see on the right. And a clear demonstration of mucosal healing can be observed via endoscopy. So we perform endoscopy under isophorin anesthesia, and we record both photo and video of the procedure. And the colitis severity as measured by endoscopy is scored on a zero to four point scale, with zero being a normal colon and four being a colon that presents with ulcerations and bleeding. Biomodels runs a number of different IBD models. And these models all have different advantages and disadvantages, and um, which model would be best for you depends on the target of your therapy, depends on whether you want to be using the model as more of a screening tool to look at a lot of different test articles or whether you're kind of focused. But yeah, they all have different advantages and disadvantages. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the DSS-induced colitis model and on the um, T helper cell adoptive T cell transfer model. Um, so starting in the DSS model, um, the benefits of the DSS model are that it's relatively short. The experiment I'll be showing today was a 21-day model, but we often sacrifice the animals at either, day, either days 19, 14, or 12. So it allows for efficient compound screening, um, and it's useful for the evaluation of both prophylactic and therapeutic treatment paradigms. So this experiment, we were looking at two different biologics of positive, control, positive controls that are used in the clinic, the anti-P40 antibody, as well as the anti-TNS antibody. So the DSS model presents with body weight loss that begins around day five. It usually peaks between days eight and 10 and recovers from there. Anti-P40 treatment is pretty effective on the body weight loss component of the model. You can see that the animals do not lose as much weight as those that are treated with vehicle and they recover their body weight more quickly. In contrast, the anti-P40 treatment, or sorry, excuse me, the anti-TNF treatment um, does not demonstrate a lot of efficacy on body weight loss. However, if you look at the colitis severity scores, both anti-P40 and anti-TNF alpha do demonstrate some benefit on um, colitis, or, um, colon inflammation. Um, so this shows that the Body weight loss and colitis severity scores do not always correlate in this model. However, both are important for assessing test article efficaciousness. So next, we're going to talk about the adaptive transfer model. So in this model, we isolate naive T helper cells from C57 black 6 donors, and we tra transfer them into immunocompromised RAG2 knockout recipients. This is a chronic model, and the animals will develop disease um, at about three to five weeks post-transfer. And this model recapitulates many aspects of the human condition, including small bowel involvement. It can be treated with both anti-TNF alpha as well as anti-P40, and it's very um, T cell focused. So I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about the difference between the model, the way we run it, and the way you've probably seen the model presented in the literature. So in the literature, the way the model is most typically presented is that the T cells are sorted using the CD45RB marker, and CD45RB high er, cells are what is put into the mouse. Um, we instead choose to sort our cells using CD62L and CD44 markers. The reasons why we like to do that are because we can do this magnetically, so the cells don't have to go through the stress of going through a flow cytometer. We can also use a negative selection um, process to do this, so the cells are completely untouched by antibody. Importantly, we do look at the cells by flow cytometry after they go through the sort, and the CD62 L positive, CD44 negative cells that go into the mice are CD45 RB high. So the cell population that ultimately is used to induce disease is the same in both approaches. It's just a difference in how we sort these cells. So this is going over an experiment in which we were, again, testing two different biologics that are used in the clinic, anti-TNF and anti-T40. 
Um, we also treated with vehicle. And as a control, we also had a group in which memory T helper cells rather than naive T helper cells were transferred into the animals. This model is a bit longer than the DSS colitis model. We can take the animals down between days 42 and 56, and we monitor the disease throughout the in-life portion by endoscopy. So animals in which a disease is induced will lose weight over time, usually beginning about day 35. And we see a protection from this body weight loss phenotype from both anti-T40 and anti-TNF treatment, unlike in VSS where we didn't see it with the anti-TNF treatment. You can also see that the animals that receive the memory T helper cells rather than the naive T helper cells do not lose weight, indicating that they do not develop disease. When we look at um, colon inflammation by endoscopy, you can again see that the animals that get the memory T cells don't develop disease, whereas those that get the T helper cells and are treated with vehicles do. We see a protection from colon inflammation that reaches statistical significance from both anti-T40 and anti-TNF treatment. So I'm next going to talk about another immune-mediated disease, multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a chronic inflammatory demyelinating disease of the central nervous system that affects more than 2.3 million people worldwide. The CNS inflammation presents just lesions or plaques within the brain and spinal cord, and the symptoms with which a patient presents vary based on the lesion site within the central nervous system, um, which is why you can see there's so many different ways this disease can present in the figure on the left. MS is considered to be an immune-mediated disease that occurs in genetically susceptible people. There's a linkage between MHC haplotype and the development of MS with patients that are, that are at haplotypes HLA-DR3, HLA-DR4, or HLA-DR15 considered to be predisposed. There's also a linkage between SNPs in genes that are linked to T-cell function, whether these are co-stimulatory molecules and APCs, um, genes involved in T-cell activation, or various downstream processes like proliferation, cytokine pathways, and signal transduction. So as I said, the disease is uh, hypothesized to develop in an immune-mediated fashion. The first thing that happens is that a currently unknown event leads to activation of myelin-specific pro-inflammatory T cells in the periphery. These T cells migrate to the CNS to the circulation, and they cross the blood-brain barrier. Within the central nervous system, antigen-presenting cells present myelin peptides to pro-inflammatory T cells, which leads to their reactivation within the CNS. These activated T cells secrete cytokines and recruit other immune cells, thus activating other T cells. This all leads to a pro-inflammatory cascade that then contributes to central nervous system tissue damage. So we model multiple sclerosis using the animal model experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, or EAE, and the history of that model comes from Rivers et al., who in 1933 found that injection of spinal cord or brain homogenate into healthy non-human primates caused a disease similar to multiple sclerosis. Today, um, the gold standard murine model is considered to be the MOG 35 to 55 model, in which um, a peptide that is derived from myelin the myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein plus adjuvant is injected into naive mice. And we also get a pertussis toxin injection on day zero and two. EAE typically presents as an ascending class of paralysis in a score on a zero to five scale, with zero being no symptoms and five being tetraplegia. So the experiment I'm showing here tested two different immunomodulatory test articles. Um, the first was vengolimod, which is an S1P modulator. It keeps the T cells inside the lymph nodes and prevents them from aggressing. And then the second test article we looked at was prezola and a steroid. So there is a little bit of a correlation between body weight loss and EAE development. When you're looking at it as an average, the groups that develop the worst disease do lose the most weight. On a single animal basis, the correlation is it's there, but it's not every time. So you can see that the animals that didn't receive treatment um, had the most weight, body weight loss. Fingolimod treatment is efficacious in preventing that body weight loss, um, and it was statistically significant compared to the animals that didn't receive treatment. Looking at EAE scores over time, um, you can see that fingolimod definitely protects from the development of EAE. This protection was overall significant and compared to animals that weren't treated or those that were treated with vehicle. Prenizolone also shows a little bit of a protective effect 
the EAE scores over time are lower than those observed in animals that are untreated or those treated with vehicle, but this did not reach statistical significance. Um, when we look at EAE incidents, this is, any, this is the number of animals that at any point over the course of the model developed a score of one or higher. Again, you can see that fingolimod it protects the animal from developing disease at all. Prenizolone doesn't really have much of an effect on um, incidence. There's a little bit of an effect, but not much. Um, it more leads to lower scores over time and compared to the other animals. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about rheumatoid arthritis, or RA. Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic autoimmune inflammatory disorder that is characterized by persistent synovial inflammation leading to the destruction of the underlying cartilage and bone. Like multiple sclerosis, certain genetic alterations increase susceptibility, for example, the HLA-DRB1 haplotype. There's also an increased risk associated with environmental stressors such as smoking. RA leads to joint damage, disability, and decreased quality of life. There's an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and pulmonary complications, and it's thought to be mediated largely by autoreactive T and B cells. So there are multiple cell types and pathways involved in the development of RA. Like multiple sclerosis, the first the kind of initiating factor is the activation of autoreactive T and B cells, likely in the periphery, although locally later. This is followed by local inflammation in the synovium. Other leukocytes arrive and produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. We see recognition of autoantibodies and perpetuation of local inflammation. This starts a feed forward loop that leads to chronic inflammation. And finally, we'll see activation of other non-immune cells at the joint and other factors released that will contribute to the breakdown of cartilage and the destruction of bone. So one model that we use to model rheumatoid arthritis is the collagen-induced arthritis model, or CIA. And the paradigm is somewhat similar to what we use for EAE. Animals are immunized with type 2 collagen that's emulsified in adjuvant on day zero. They get a boost with collagen on day 21, followed by just a general immuno or inflammatory boost of LPS on day 25. With this model, we see joint and foot inflammation that begins around days 25 to 30, with peak inflammation seen around 25 to 40. And outcomes include weight loss and survival, clinical arthritis score, and paw thickness measurements. The, the arthritis is scored using a scoring scale from zero to four, with zero being no swelling, and for being excessive swelling with joint rigidity. So this shows an experiment where we were treating with another immune modulator, dexamethasone, which is a steroid. In this experiment, we actually randomized the animals into treatment groups on, on day 21 by their arthritis score. So here we can see that after randomization, the animals that are not treated do lose um, more weight as compared to the animals that are naive or were treated with the steroid. Um, this didn't reach statistical significance, but the association was there. We saw a significant protection from the arthritis score increase in dexamethasone treatment and compared to animals that were treated with vehicle. And we also saw significantly lower paw thickness measurements over time in animals treated with dexamethasone and compared to those treated with vehicle. Um, so with that, uh, just to briefly go over what I discussed, we went over IBD, um, multiple sclerosis, and RA. We discussed the disease background um, as well as animal models for all of these. Up next, Andrew is going to talk about allergic asthma and GDHD. Thank you, Caitlin, for that nice summary. I'll next be talking about allergic asthma followed up by graft versus host disease. Allergic asthma is a chronic respiratory condition that is characterized by a specific uh, inflammatory response. Well, it is largely seen to be a Th2 type of inflammation. Th1 also plays a large component in the disease. During the course of asthma, this immune response will lead to a number of things, but ultimately will cause bronchoconstriction, uh, which ultimately leads to difficulty in breathing in the patients. More than 25 million cases in the U.S. are out there, and this results in about $56 billion of direct and indirect costs per year. There is no cure for this disease, but there are a lot of treatments that have been shown to be effective thus far. The majority of the treatments that are out there at this time include inhaled corticosteroids or long-acting bronchodilators, though there is a proportion of asthmatics uh, that do not respond to this, these treatments, and uh, these are more so considered a severe asthma phenotype which shows a mix of Th1 and Th2 response. So today we're going to review some of the models uh, of allergic asthma uh, and how we can measure 
the efficacy of certain treatments in, the, in these diseases. A couple of things that are examined in the clinic when assessing levels of disease uh, include biomarkers as well as lung function. So samples from the patient, such as sputum or serum, are investigated for the presence of different inflammatory cells or different inflammatory mediators, uh, including certain cytokines and chemokines. Uh, additionally, lung function is explored uh, in this disease and measures of forced expiratory volume, uh, forced vital capacity are, are often measured uh, during spirometry of the clinic. And uh, we also sometimes look at airway resistance and lung compliance. And we have a, a device here at Biomodels that we can use to look at a number of these uh, lung function measurements. So I'm briefly going to go over some of the, the endpoints that we commonly examine in the allergic asthma models. One of the big tells of a successful induction is being able to identify specific cell types in the bronchioalveolar lavage fluid. So in this technique, the animals are terminally tracheotomized. The lungs are then washed with usually PBS or saline, and these cells are taken out, stained, and mounted on slides so that we're able to see the makeup of the inflammatory cell contents of the lung. And so, as you can see in this image here, here we have naive animals, and the majority cell type that is seen are the, are the resident macrophages that are found in the lung. So we'll still see a large amount of cells in this bronchioalveolar lavage or bowel fluid, um, but when we look at the asthmatic or HDM or whatever allergen was used to induce the model, we'll see a much higher percentage of neutrophils as well as eosinophils. So in addition to looking at the cell contents of the bowel fluid, uh, we can also look at the supernatant. And with that supernatant, we can look at different inflammatory mediators, such as cytokines and chemokines that are common to disease, as well as looking at total protein. And these are good indicators of the level of disease. Additionally, we may look at serum contents or lung homogenates as well for, for different inflammatory mediators and, and protein content. Another common endpoint that we will look at um, in these asthma models is a histological endpoint. So with a basic H&E stain, you can see the general pathology in the lungs and levels of inflammation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, when I get into the specific data slides. Um, but we'll also commonly stain uh, with the Mason's trichrome stain, which will look at collagen deposition and some of the more severe models of asthma. Uh, you do see a bit more fibrosis. And then uh, another common stain we use is a PAS stain. Uh, which will show mucus protection by the goblet cells, which is increased in asthma. And then additionally, we can stain for any markers of interest within the lung tissue. And so another set of endpoints that we, we measure uh, in this model is some of the functional lung measurements. And so this mechanical ventilator flex event that we have here allows us to look at different lung resistances and compliance measures uh, within the lung both at a baseline and following a methacholine challenge. So in these asthma models, a challenge with methacholine will show airway hyperresponsiveness in the asthmatic uh, animals. So basically in this readout, uh, we'll administer different aerosolized doses of methacholine. And as you increase the dose of methacholine, you will see increases in airway resistance in the, in the asthmatic mice. Here we show uh, ones that were sensitized with OVA. And here with the naive animal, you see that the, the increase is much lower. And so both either the area under the curve or kind of the maximum response can be measured in the system. And as you can see how it's graphed here with the asthmatic mice, uh, we see higher airway resistance measures. Um, and I'll go over a little bit more within each model, kind of the trends that we expect to see. So I'd first like to give kind of an overview of a number of the models that we've run here. Um, one being the ovalbumin induced model. Um, and this is one of the most widely used models. And there's a lot of, and this model has been characterized well in the literature. Some of the other models that we have run um, use um, more physiological allergens. So either a house dust mite or cockroach allergen induced model. And the basic outline of these models is that they will initially have a sensitization phase, which includes exposure to the allergen um, either on its own or in the presence of a, an adjuvant. And then these studies basically run two to three weeks long um, and can be tailored kind of based on whether you're targeting more of an acute to a chronic response. Um, so generally in the first day or a couple times early in the study, we'll have a sensitization and then a challenge towards the end of the study. And then we'll measure all those endpoints that I had gone over um, a day or two after that final challenge. And so 
all of these timelines and these studies can be tailored kind of to specifically look at outcome or the effect of different different treatments. And we can treat with a by various routes, including intranasal, intratracheal. We have the ability to aerosolize uh, nose only dosing, IV, subcutaneous, intraperitoneal, as well as oral cabbage. So first gonna run through kind of the most well defined model. Um, and this is an OVA induced uh, asthma model. So in the beginning of this model, uh, we will sensitize the mice with uh, OVA protein as well in the presence of an adjuvant and alum is often used as this adjuvant. Um, so they're given an IP injection on both day zero and seven. And then uh, a week or two later, uh, they'll be given a, a challenge either on consecutive days or whether or on a single day um, prior to measuring the endpoints. And the endpoints are generally measured a day after that final challenge. And so uh, when we're intervening with a positive control such as dexamethasone or fluticasone, uh, we would generally target um, just prior to some of the challenges or within the range uh, of challenges. And this shows a generally very good result in uh, combating this asthmatic phenotype. And so this is some of the data that we've gathered in the OVA model. So here we're just first looking at inflammatory cells in uh, the bronchoalveolar or lavage. And so the cells that we're considering here are macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils, and lymphocytes. So as you can see in a naive animal, uh, we see a very low amount of cells. Um, in mice that have been challenged, uh, sensitized and challenged with OVA, uh, we see a, a large increase in those cells. And we've also shown that there's a dose dependence upon the amount of OVA that is given. So we usually target kind of a, a lower dose um, because we found that these lower doses are, are more treatable with some of the interventions that we've, that we've used in this model. So as you can see here with dexamethasone, um, you can kind of prevent that increase uh, in the inflammatory cells. So you don't bring it all the way down to baseline, you do see kind of the efficacy of that, of that intervention. And then is, as this OVA model, um, or TH2 skewed in eosinophilic. We just wanted to show here that the eosinophils are increased at both doses of OVA and that when you treat with dexamethasone, you see kind of preventing uh, that increase in uh, eosinophils. Then looking here at the histology, you see in the sensitized and challenged animals, more inflammatory cells in the airways um, and that this decrease is observed when pretreated with dexamethasone. And then to go on to some of the functional measurements here with OVA and dexamethasone, I had showed this previously. At higher doses of methylcholine, you see a, a large increase in airway resistance as well as tissue elastins. Um, and this is kind of just on a time scale here during those responses. But these graphs below just summarize uh, the average values or the area under the curve at each of those points. And you can see that with the OVA sensitization, we see the highest airway resistance and elastins but with treatment with uh, dexamethasone, that brings it closer down to the baseline. So this is one of the successful treatments for this model. Another common model that we run is the house dust mite induced allergic asthma model. And so this is a very similar induction paradigm to the OVA model, whereas we'll sensitize on day zero and seven. Um, in this model, we use more of a physiological uh, route of exposure. So we will sensitize intranasally and then challenge on day 14 again intranasally. And so if we wanted to intervene with any of our positive control treatments, this is usually done just prior to the challenge or sometimes prior and after in the case of fluticasone. So looking again at kind of the, the common endpoints here with the HDM used instead of OVA as the, the allergen, uh, we see kind of a, a dose dependent increase in inflammatory cells, eosinophils, and then here we see increases in, in neutrophils and don't follow that same dose dependence. Um, but I think the important thing to show here is that Use of dexamethasone as a positive control treatment shows uh, significant drops in these ind indications of, of the asthma phenotype. And then again here, we're showing kind of the same thing with uh, inflammatory cells with luticasone. Um, and then here, just showing some histology, um, both the H&E and PAS staining. And so here we have the normal naive uh, control mice here uh, with very few uh, inflammatory cells. Um, but here uh, in the HDM challenged animal, we see significant increases in some of the inflammation within the alveolar spaces as well as surrounding uh, the vessels. And so this is uh, the normal PS stain. And then in the affected animals, um, you see these arrows here pointing to goblet cells um, where we observe increased mucus production. And then 
Another endpoint that we often do in these studies um, is to look at some of the inflammatory mediators within the bowel fluid. And so in this graph here, we're looking at some of the common Th2 cytokines that are common to the disease. Um, so here we show significant increases from naive animals in IL-4, 5, and 6. Um, and then with our positive control treatments, we see significant decreases um, in those cytokines. Looking at CH1 cytokines in this model, um, we're just showing IL-1 beta here. Uh, we don't see the same trends of increase in this model. So this shows that it's more specifically a CH2 response. And again, these are just showing the efficacy of some of these positive control treatments on, on the functional measurements of the lung. Here just showing airway resistance, as you can see, uh, the naive kind of baseline levels of airway resistance when given higher doses of methacholine. And then uh, here we have the vehicle uh, control. And then with both of the positive control treatments, um, we see that that airway resistance levels are brought back down closer to baseline. And so the final asthma model that I'm going to run through today is a, a severe asthma model. So this shows a bit more of a robust phenotype and differs in the, in the other HD, from the other HDM model in that we'll be giving an adjuvant, adjuvant during the sensitization phase of the model. And so initially on day zero, HDM mixed with complete Froyan's adjuvant is given, and this is given subcutaneously, and then the challenge is performed intranasally on day 14. And so this model mimics the uh, kind of some of the severe cases of asthma that are seen in the clinic and that they're insensitive to some of the inhaled corticosteroids or corticosteroid treatments that, have, that show positive control. So the data I'll be showing here is, is just of uh, naive and vehicle animals. So again, looking at the, the bowel contents in these animals, we see a significant increase in total cell count again in the sensitized and challenged animals, as well as increases in eosinophils and neutrophils. So as I had mentioned previously, um, in the mixed TH1 and 2 response, we see a, a much larger increase in neutrophils here as well. And then again, looking at the cytokines, we see increased levels of TH2 cytokines. And additionally, we see increases in a number of TH1 cytokines, including interferon gamma, IL-12, P40, IL-12, P70, as well as IL-17. And again, just showing uh, the lung functional measurements that we see a large increase in the airway resistance following the highest dose of methacholine challenge in these asthmatic animals. So just as an overview, uh, we just briefly went over the OVA-induced model, which is primarily eosinophilic, on um, the most well-characterized model of allergic asthma, and then some, a couple of the more physiological relevant models, the HDM and the cockroach allergen-induced asthma models, uh, where neutrophilic inflammation is much more present. They were able to show that dexamethasone and fluticasone serve as uh, good positive controls in these models and then briefly touched on how in the severe model that uh, there's some steroid insensitivity and a mixed TH1 to response. Um, and so the models that we presented today are, are kind of on the shorter of the timelines, and they can be tailored um, based upon any of the client needs, as a number of chronic models are, can be taken out a lot longer than what we've shown here today. So I'm next going to move on to another immunologically driven disease uh, known as graft-versus-host disease. So graft-versus-host disease results in patients that have undergone a hemopoietic stem cell transplant. And a majority of the patients, well, around 80%, will exhibit signs of this disease within the first couple of weeks uh, following the transplant. And um, there's also a very large contingent of these, these patients that will develop a more chronic TBHD, which is the leading cause of death uh, in people that have had this disease. So um, there are a number of drugs on the market now that are successful, but they all kind of aim to, to have a better effect and better outcome in these patients. And so uh, a number of organ systems are targeted during this disease, including the skin, uh, different mucosa, the GI tract, liver, and lungs. And the important thing to remember about this disease is that the T cells that are derived from the graft are driving the disease. So in the animal model, we attempt to mimic uh, this these parameters. And so in the acute GBHD model that we, we run here at Biomodels, we give a, a transplant of a bone, a bone marrow, which is supplemented with lymphocytes, which is where we get the T cells um, that, are, that are introduced into these mice. And so these mice in this model are, have an um, MHC mismatch, and this is what's driving the disease. And so I mentioned that the, the T cells that are transferred are what is driving the disease. Um, what we'll do first is we'll deplete uh, the T cells from the bone marrow and then add back splenocytes, and that is the T cell component in the disease. 
Um, so initially we'll first irradiate these biopsy mice um, and then they're given a their, their bone marrow transfer and we see uh, the graft versus disease developing in about two weeks. And so I'm going to just briefly go over some of the readouts that we that are important for this model, uh, one being the graft versus host disease score. And this is kind of a weighted score based on five different parameters, including weight loss, animal activity, uh, the posture of the animal, and then its fur texture and skin integrity. So each of these components are given a score ranging from zero to two, uh, zero being normal. And then as the disease worsens, you can see a characteristic worsening of each of these components. And so in this first graph, uh, I'm just showing uh, the weight loss component of the disease. So the five different groups here include a control group in which no splenocytes were given. And so this, this group will not have any disease because of the lack of T cells that are given in the cell transfer. And then we have a group that is given a high dose of splenocytes in addition to the bone marrow, and then another group that's given a low dose of splenocytes, including the bone marrow. And so, as you can see here with the weight loss, uh, we see less weight loss when less splenocytes are given, uh, just as an indicator that disease is, is based on the amount of T cells that are given. And so here in this bone marrow transplant, you see uh, the best kind of recovery from the initial conditioning of the animal. So the basic trend that we're seeing here is kind of um, the result of the total body radiation recovery and engraftment, and then around day 14 is when we see the, the disease setting in. So the, the decrease in weight loss after that time is, is due to uh, kind of severity, the severity of the disease. Uh, a couple of the treatments that have been shown to be efficacious in the, the clinic include FK506 and anti-P40. Um, as you can see here, these don't have a huge effect on weight loss, and that's generally what we see in the model, but although these uh, have positive effects on survival, we don't see uh, any positive effect on the weight loss. The next graph I'm showing here is uh, a graph of the GVHD score. So as you can see, you kind of have this bump here um, in the same time frame uh, when the animals are losing weight and then recovering. And so from day 14 on is, is when we uh, consider this disease uh, being active. So you can see with no splenocytes, there's basically no score, and towards the end of the disease, you get a little bump in score, but basically um, those scores will be very low. Um, in animals with a lower splenocyte dose, you'll see kind of a low, lower GVHD score, um, and then animals that have given kind of our normal standard high dose splenocytes show this characteristic increase uh, beginning at day 14. And so again, as I have mentioned, these two Positive controls that are often used for grafters with host disease don't show any um, significant effect on uh, the GBHD score. So the, the effect that these drugs do have, however, is on survival. So you can see with no splenocytes, the animals survive very well. Between the high and low dose doses of splenocytes, there's a difference. Um, and then you see actual significant results using uh, the FK506 drug, but you definitely see beneficial effects with both of these treatments. And so that acute GVHD model I just described um, was one of the models that we run um, and is the major mismatch, MHC mismatch model. We also run a number of models um, of minor mismatch, um, but I won't be presenting those today. Um, the final model of GVHD that I'll present is our humanized model. So in this model, we will inject human PBMCs into immunocompromised mice. Um, and they are sometimes uh, conditioned first with TBI, but this is not always needed. Uh, and this will lead to a, uh, a GVHG disease that is assessed in the same way that the acute model is assessed based on the score, weight loss, and survival. So um, when we get our human PBMCs, we have a number of standard donors. Um, and as you can see from this graph, that based on the donor, we sometimes see a different severity of disease. So here we have three different donors and a mouse that has not received any human PBMCs. You can see the weight loss there is, is basically stagnant. Um, but then you sh we show here three different donors with both a high and low dose of these PBMCs that are given. Um, as you see with the high doses of all the donors, you see much more rapid weight loss. Um, but between the donors, they're, at the lower doses, there's uh, a lot of variability uh, in the time that disease uh, sets in. And this can also be observed uh, with the GVHD scores. Um, so that was when we have kind of validated this model, we, we know exactly when 
disease is, is setting in based on the specific model and the inoculum of cells that is given. So this can be tailored in a way to kind of maximize the therapeutic window um, when, treat, when treating this disease. And then finally, um, just showing the survival and how variable this can be between donors and how it is based also upon the initial inoculum of cells that is given. So um, we can, we have tailored kind of our standard model to respond in a specific amount of time with survival, weight loss, as well as GVHD scored. So in summary, we presented two GVHD models today, one being the, the MHD mismatch, and this is between BALB-C recipients and C57 black 6 donors. This shows a very predictable disease um, as engraftment sets in, and the components and readouts of this disease are, are well established and, and, prevent, and present a, a nice therapeutic window. Additionally, we presented the humanized GVHD model, and both of these models can kind of be tailored by giving different amounts of T cells to kind of tailor the timing and mortality and disease that might be perfect for your therapeutic application. I'd now like to hand this off to Ben. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Very happy to, to be here um, with everybody this morning to round out um, our presentation and um, tell you all a little bit about our um, very recent work we've been doing in immuno-oncology. And this cartoon as an introduction is just um, showing some of the myriad critical interactions um, between tumor cells, T cells, and antigen presenting cells that will ultimately dictate how uh, the, the T cell reacts to the tumor and whether it will be successful in uh, attacking the tumor or whether it's going to not. So as you are all are probably familiar, um, immunomodulatory therapies led by immune checkpoint inhibiting antibodies have really transformed clinical cancer treatment uh, for some tumor types over the last few years. And this cartoon really on the right is uh, just showing some of the response rates that we're seeing to, to some of the major um, FDA-approved um, immune checkpoint inhibiting antibodies. And you can see that we really have uh, a lot of work um, towards improving the durable response rates of these existing approved therapies and also validating rational combinations to, to continue to improve these responses, while also coming up with novel approaches towards non-responding tumor types. So for that reason, uh, developing novel immunotherapies in oncology um, is going to be critical. And uh, we do that in preclinical models, much like these other disease indications. And we really need a complete model system that recapitulates these complex biological interactions. Um, and we also need it to be um, uh, performed in, in a way that's clinically recapitulative. Cancer patients are undergoing a lot of different treatments um, and uh, a lot of different therapies, including antibiotic treatments, uh, surgery, radiation treatments, standard chemotherapies, in addition to these immunotherapies. And so we really need to, to, to consider these in our models. And for this reason, we're always trying to innovate our in vivo and ex vivo models to enable the translation of these next generation of anti-cancer immunotherapies. Probably uh, this slide is just showing uh, the, the most commonly used models uh, currently in immuno-oncology. Um, probably the, the most commonly used uh, model where all of the, the immunotherapies in clinical trials and, and approved to date have gone through is the, the syngenetic models, um, where most often the, the mice are being engrafted with um, murine cell lines that have been uh, established and, and cultured in 2D. Um, this is a, a you know, it, it's the workhorse of the industry. Um, however, um, you know, the, the translatability of uh, test uh, therapies coming through this model is still um, quite low, uh, only about 5 to, to 10 percent at top. So we think that we can do a lot better in the preclinical side to I improve um, the, the predictive nature of these models. Um, as moving to the right, you can see um, that genetically engineered models uh, have played a, a critical role. Um, these can be uh, transgenic models containing human uh, components of the, of the immune system or um, uh, uh, um, other uh, drivers, and really there's a, a large 
um, range of transgenic and genetically engineered models that can be used in different ways. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of these are, are under license and, um, you know, uh, that can be costly. Um, some of the, you know, the, the drivers re require a very long um, lead time to develop a, a, a spontaneous um, tumor if you're going to go that route. Um, so there are some drawbacks to, to uh, the genetically engineered models as well. Um, and then moving to the right again, uh, we start with a genetically engineered model um, to, um, to make a severely immune compromised mouse. Um, and these can then be engrafted with uh, human uh, immune cells and to reconstitute, at least in part, uh, a human immune system. And these models are, are becoming more and more uh, widely used to um, really model um, human, human interactions between human immune system and human tumor. So this is what I'm going to focus on today. I'd also like to point out some of our ex vivo assessments. Um, downstream of the in vivo, really we can look at mechanism and more precise readouts with ex vivo techniques, including quantitative imaging, such as immunohistochemistry, ex vivo IVIS, uh, and um, multiplex uh, instrument. And then finally, we can take um, you know, these ex vivo uh, cells and then do adoptive transfer experiments back into you know, new naive mice and really see um, how well we're able to convey this immunity into new mice and specific tumor immunity. So we're really trying to work at the cutting edge of this uh, rapidly d developing field. Um, and this is just a, a board from a triple humanized mouse model that we presented at AACR um, annual meeting uh, this year. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that this today. I'm going to actually talk about a little bit work that's even more current. But I'd be happy to tell you more about this triple humanized mouse model, um, or it's also captured in a previous webinar that, that we've uh, presented this year. Um, but we've, we've had uh, the opportunity and experience to work across a, a, a lot of different therapeutic strategies um, in, in immuno-oncology. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, optimizing uh, preconditioning regimens to maximize engraftment efficiency and multi-lineage differentiation uh, of a human CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cell humanized um, mouse model. So the humanized mouse models are generally um, uh, done either with transfer of human PBMCs, as um, Andrew talked about a, a little bit, and this allows for partial humanization of uh, T cell, uh, T -cell uh, subsets. And also, uh, um, we can also perform a, a more complete model where we're engrafting human uh, CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells, and this allows uh, partial humanization of um, really the full hematopoietic system, including many of the uh, key lineages. Now, there's challenges to both models. Now, um, in the PBMC model, as, as Andrew uh, uh, talked about, we, we do see uh, there's a risk of GVHD, and we've done some work to minimize that in, in our hands and uh, in our models for, for assessing tumor, anti-tumor efficacy. The challenge in the uh, uh, CD34 uh, HSC model is uh, maximizing engraftment and also maximizing uh, full-spectrum lineage differentiation. So I'm going to focus on that today. And this is just a cartoon showing, you know, the different major uh, lineages, and we want to try to humanize all of them um, accurately and, and completely. So preconditioning regimens basically are, are used to ablate the murine host bone marrow to produce a, a niche to allow the engraftment of the human cells. This is done most often with radiation, uh, chemical, um, or, or genetic methods. So we tested a few different methods to try to optimize both engraftment and lineage differentiation. Um, we have both chemical and radiation methods. For the chemical, we did either one or two doses of busulfan. And for the uh, radiation, we're doing um, increasing doses of total body um, ionizing radiation. 
So we carried the, this study out to 16 weeks. Uh, we did not see any suggestion of GVHD um, in, in any of the, our engraftment. Um, but I just wanted to show the first 20 days to show that the weight loss is indicating that um, we had some, um, the, the TBI went as expected. And then, um, of course, we're, we're going to look at our different cell populations by flow cytometry. Um, this is sort of a, a picture of the, the, the type of flow cytometer we have here, which is a, um, a max quant system. And we're able to measure engraftment over time by taking uh, peripheral blood draws and uh, looking at um, the percentage of human uh, CD45 positive cells um, compared to a mouse. And uh, we can see that um, in the peripheral blood and in the bone marrow, we're getting uh, a, um, well, we get statistically significant engraftment with all of the preconditioning regimens, but really the two doses of Bruce Hoffman was best and statistically better than some of the other preconditioning regimens in terms of maximizing engraftment. That's summed up in the three tissues here, um, in the, the peripheral blood, the bone marrow, and, and spleen um, are what we uh, assessed. And you can see that we're, we're getting uh, around 20% engraftment um, the, in, in these compartments with the, uh, the, the two doses of brucelfin, which was the, um, our, our top uh, candidate in this study. We also looked at uh, lineage differentiation. Uh, this is showing the spleen. No, sorry, this is showing the bone marrow. And um, the color coding is, um, so the, the yellow is B cells um, characterized by CD20 staining. The red is myeloid cells, CD33. These are all human specific. The P uh, in the green is uh, progenitor cells. They're uh, CD34 positive cells. The purple is NK populations, um, CD56 positive, um, and uh, the T cells are, are CD3 positive cells. And you can see with the different engraftment schemes, we actually do get slightly different um, lineage um, distributions in, in uh, the bone marrow. You can see that the, um, the busulfan groups actually have less NK cells showing up than the um, radiation groups, and we're actually getting a statistically significant increase in myeloid uh, lineage with the uh, 1.75 gray of TBI. Um, I thought it was interesting that um, the question mark are just other cells, cells that were negative for all of these populations, and these may be critical cells for um, these studies. So um, you can see better in the spleen, you see B cells predominate in when we have no preconditioning or with low uh, single dose busulfam. But we're able to see more myeloid lineages and also an increase in these question mark cells uh, in the radiation groups. Um, so you really see that with different preconditioning regimens, we can get slightly different um, and in some cases statistically significant lineage differentiation in different compartments. And these can be optimized um, for your purposes. So just to sum up very quickly, um, preconditioning regimens for humanized uh, immune system mouse models can impact engraftment potential and lineage differentiation. And we can now uh, work to select a particular preconditioning regimen to maximize humanization of lineage of interest critical to your particular therapeutic target and, and mechanism. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for listening and acknowledge our great team of uh, technical uh, staff, our other scientists here, and our, our upper management. Really, everybody is, is, is um, very dedicated here, and we're thankful and, and really uh, committed to, to translating uh, novel therapies to patients here at Biomodels. Thank you all for listening, and please don't hesitate to reach out to um, any of us to, uh, for if you have any questions or would like to discuss anything further. Thank you thank very you for, much. I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'd like to thank our presenters for today, Caitlin, Andrew, and Ben. Thank you so much for your presentations. If you have any questions, feel free to chat them in, and I will forward those along via email. I'd like to thank Biomodels LLC for sponsoring today. And most of all, I'd like to thank those of you who came and spent this time with us. We're very grateful to have you here, and we hope you gained some information that will make things a bit easier. Thank you so much, and have a great day.